This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. All righty, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and if you got some stuff you want to talk about that's garden related, I, I know it's hot, I know it's humid, I know a lot of places it's dry. I get it. It ain't fun gardening in the deep south in the summer. Heck, it's not fun gardening in the sun anywhere, especially when it's hot and humid, too. But anyway, we're going to talk about it. I know a lot of folks have been emailing with questions about bugs and blights and problems with weeds and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I can I can do some problem solving. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. If this is a product I think will work, I'll recommend it if something I would use or recommend my mother would use. But I'm not here to sell stuff. And if there's something that you can do easier, I'll sure go it that way because shortcuts in gardening are almost synonymous. Uh, but anyway, it's, a, it's a, a live program. You want to call in and chat about your garden, your flowers, vegetables, herbs, lawns, trees, fruits, house plants. Uh, we've got something new want to try to propagate something uh, bugs blights weeds that kind of stuff give us a call it's toll free one eight seven seven mpb ring and we're going to be talking about a, a, a few odds and ends including, including a, a classic pass along plant that's blooming all over the state right now that nobody sells but you see it everywhere which tells us there's an undercurrent of people sharing stuff which is a good thing and a lot of times these plants are markers of social connections and we're going to be talking about one of my favorite heat of the summer type of old-fashioned perennials it comes back matter of fact it comes back so much that you want to share it with people because uh it's one of those kind of a little bit aggressive thing but we'll talk about that and got a, a kind of a laid-back tune coming up in a few minutes but uh, again if you want to give us a call and chat about stuff that'd be Great. Uh, hey, Java, let me ask you something. We were chatting. I, I, I got a, a letter this past week from a, from a listener about elderberries and, and virus. You know about that? Yeah, elderberries is a um, – I, I put the S on it, but elderberry is a, um, it's a, a natural remedy that a lot of people use, especially for coughing, cold. And um, my experience comes with having young children. It's something that you can give them instead of giving them like a harsh uh, cold medicine yeah. when they're so young. It's like a natural thing. It seemed to work on it okay, or does it just make them feel make you feel better because it shuts them up? Well, no. It, <laughs> well, for one, it's it's really sweet, yeah. so it's easy for them to take. But no, it, it does a good job. Well, this is a, 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 a alert about some research of uh, elderberry, which is native to Mississippi. You know, we've got a really we got a good one here. It's not the elderberry that you see in in uh, the Northeast or in England, which is a tree. This is a herbaceous perennial. It dies down, comes back up in the spring, but. Big flat cluster, dinner plate size clusters of white flowers, followed by uh, dark purple berries, almost almost black berries. But uh, elderberry, uh, you can make an extract from it from the elderberry fruit, um, and it's got all sorts of of, of folklore and now research based uh, benefits. I would like to mention though that um, the green berries, if they're not ripe, they can be they they can upset your stomach. You know, it's called poisonous, but not kind of it's going to kill you. But uh, anyway, they've got a uh, um, a lot of research about this. The the one that's common in Mississippi, you make fruit in the summer. Um, you can make pies with it. You make jellies with it. You make tea with it. All sorts of stuff. But uh, if you make your own tincture or extract, um, you know you can actually use it to. Uh, to, to make you feel better if you got a little bit of throat infection and that kind of stuff. I would like to mention, though, a lot of those along the roadside, which are easy to see, used to be they were sprayed with herbicides. Ain't nobody spraying with herbicides, and it's out there right now. It won't have herbicide in it because the herbicides would have killed it. Uh, but and if you do get some along the roadside, I'll be sure to wash them off because all sorts of dust and stuff like that on there. But anyway, I appreciate a listener uh, sending that in. It's a real interesting stuff about a, a cool native plant. I try not to get into to uh, uh, herbal or, or medicinal plants plants because of legal stuff i'm not a not a doctor that's what we have we have uh, medical programs here for for that uh but it's a cool plant and if you don't want to use it to, for your cold or don't want to make jelly or whatever it's a great big pretty blooming plant good for pollinators got great fruit which is good for birds and, and, and other things like that it's a great native plant so uh that's yes, elderberry uh hey let's start out uh this morning in flowood and talk with linda hey linda good morning good morning elder how are you I am well. Good. What's I, up? I have a question about lantana. Mm-hmm. And, uh, a few weeks ago, I heard you say that when you have your lantana and it has these little white spots on them and they stop blooming, yeah, that it's a, some kind of insect or something. Spider mite. Right. So I went out and I 
I clipped off, cut it, cut it kind of back. The, the parts that have the um, stuff on it, it's grown back real pretty. But it is, uh, and the the bites seem to be gone. But mm-hmm. they're not; they're they're still not blooming. Yeah, you know, this is, it, oddly enough, it's one of the weird things. Lantana is one of the most commonly grown summer perina, great butterfly, hummingbird plant. Everything about it is is good for, for the garden. I have one site on one side of my yard that is covered. It like, never does anything, and, yeah. And, it, and it just blooms and blooms, and they, these that I have in the pot are just, like, they seem like they're growing, like yeah. they're really reaching for the sun. So. yeah. Well, here's the deal. Uh, Lantana and uh, some some subtropical plants like Bougainvillea and things like that, uh, if they grow in pretty good dirt, you know, it doesn't stay too wet, but but good, firm, well-drained dirt, uh, they have a different kind of root system than that grown in well-prepared soil or in potting soil. They don't have, it's like plants growing in water, different kind of root structure, and they're not quite as efficient. And a lot of times these plants want to be on the lean and mean side, and they don't quite get that in good dirt with with fertilizer or water. So uh, not much I can, I mean, th- again, this is a real common question, 40 years of why is my lantana not blooming and my neighbors are blooming great. And there's really not a good solution other than just don't push them with a lot of water. It's, yours is in a pot, so you got to keep it watered, but don't keep it wet. Let it get, you know, keep, you know, stress it a little bit. And, uh, you know, hold back on the amount of fertilizer you use at a time. It needs fertilizer in a pot, but not much. What's that? But I have not put any fertilizer in it, but it well, does have potting soil. Yeah, well, the, the plant, potted plants need fertilizer. I mean, for, potting soil doesn't have the n- essential nutrients. That, it's, it's like it's like the possum. I've got a little baby possum in, in a cage, and I have to feed it a real balanced diet or else it's going to get grouchy on me because it can't forage outside the cage and get what it needs. I give it cicadas and worms and grubs and stuff like that along with cat food. Well, plants mm-hmm. in pots need a little fertilizer, but I, I always recommend... Whatever the directions call, whatever it says to mix in water or put in plant, that's the maximum they can legally get away with recommending. Use it half strength. Good fertilizer, so maybe half I strength. Need to put a little fertilizer. Well, in. if you have it, you know they're they're not getting the stuff they I need. You know, it. you know it's just like sending a kid to school without breakfast. They're just not gonna, you know, they're gonna flag by the middle of the day. So, but again, okay. again, half strength and try not to keep it too wet. I will. Thank you. Uh, let me throw out one other thing, Linda, and this is okay. really, really odd. I was talking about this with a friend of mine yesterday. You know, when we get scared or something, uh, get hurt or something, we get this burst of, of adrenaline that makes us get up and go. Well, plants have a hormone. I don't know if it's a hormone or an auction, one of those kind of things, called traumatin. And if you sort of rough a plant up a little bit, you know, take your fingers and, you know, bend it and slap it around, you know, don't get mm-hmm. abusive, but just, just rough it up. That's, mm-hmm. that puts out a, a, a hormone called traumatin that stimulates flower production. Oh, I mean, it it, it's, it's, fight or flight. So well, it, it's, it's flight. you know, a lot of people have heard about taking a stick, switching your okra or root pruning your mm-hmm. plants, whatever, or in the fall when we have hurricanes and uh, the plants on the coast get really beat up by wind and all of a sudden you have spring blooming wisteria and bloom. It's because it get beat up and this, this traumatism sort of, you know, take a stick to it without breaking it okay. and, and it'll make you feel better, too. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck, Good Ellen. Luck. Hey, let's let's know how it works. Okay, thank you. All righty. Now let's slide up to the ice box to Corinth, way up in the northeast of Mississippi. Hey, Mike. Good morning. Hey. Good morning. Uh, I had a uh, just an observation and mm-hmm. a question too. Uh, we have uh, Japanese beetles up here in the summer for oh, a yeah. couple of months, and this year they invaded on D Day. <laughs> But uh, they don't seem to be quite as bad this time. They usually go away about the uh, 1st of August. But uh, I just had an observation that, uh, and a question, too. Why do they pick the, uh, most as far as roses, mostly yellow and pink roses rather than red roses? You know, I... I- I, I don't. I, I've never observed that. I, matter of fact, I haven't heard that before. I, I know that it seemed like up, my friends up in in New England and the Midwest they have a serious problem with it. I mean, nothing like we've ever seen. And uh, I really, I, 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 I don't know. I've never heard that before. You know, yeah. and, and I can I can make an educated guess about you know the the the. No, I don't know. I ain't gonna guess. I don't know. 
they normally <laughs> like the yellow first, and then and then the pink. They they do eat red rose blooms too, but mostly yellow and pink. But well, the, well, I, I know that I know that some insects, some pests like white flies and things like that, uh, are attracted to the color yellow, and they're repelled by you know. They, th- there's research that showed if you use a reflective red mulch on their tomato plants, it repels aphids, and if they want to trap insects in greenhouses and stuff, they hang these sticky cards that are colored yellow. So it might be something along those lines. You know, that's just anecdotal, but I know that reflective red mulch repels aphids, and that yellow sticky cards attract insects for to, to, to for traps. So it might be something about how they see stuff. I live in uh, Alcorn County, and I, I, for what I've read, they migrate from east to west. So I don't know how far across the state from Alcorn they progress, but... Uh, we get I, I get calls about them rarely from from uh, central and south Mississippi. Uh, when I was a kid in the Delta, I caught one just every now and then because they're pretty. And that, as far as beetles go, they're pretty iridescent green. They're just as pretty as they can be. But uh, the further north you go and up in the mountains, the the uh, it might have to do with cold winter. Or I don't I don't know, but you don't see them as much along the coast as you do up in the mountains. This is the fourth year we've had them. Uh... Well, four or four years ago, we never saw them. Well, you were lucky because yeah. they they they've been a serious problem for many decades. Yeah, so. they 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 uh, just as far as a leaf, they will just skeletonize. Oh yeah, and, oh yeah. Uh, they love grape leaves and uh, leaves of fruit trees. Well, all I remember as a kid, I was an, a pretty avid insect collector. I studied into entomology in college, but I was always, when a teenager, I had pretty extensive insect collection. I just remember they're pretty beetles, and I didn't really care, uh, you know, where I found them, and my mother really didn't appreciate me boogering up all her plants looking for bugs and stuff. But anyway, as a good observation, I just made an educated guess, and with a, a qualified, I don't know. Yeah, they're they're pretty devastating to roses too. But yeah. uh, that that's all uh, I had. I won't take up any more. Okay. Of your time. Well, I, 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 I appreciate it. If you, if you come across some research on that, shoot me an email about it. Enjoy your program. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, i got something kind of fun coming up next week. Next Wednesday, I'm going to be doing a live program, streaming. You know, you can watch it live uh, while, while I do it, or you can can uh, download uh, look it on Facebook a little bit later. But it's, uh, it's going to be with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Uh, I'm doing a program. Uh, they, they're doing a little summer program. And I'm doing uh, one called uh, Wednesday, July 22nd, from 12 to 1. I'm going to do a, a part of their History is Lunch series. I'm going to give a program called Over and Under the Fence, Historic Pass-Along Plants as Social Glue. And I'm going to talk about how, how all these plants you see in people's yards that you know they didn't buy. You, you know they didn't buy because nobody sells or hardly anybody sells them. Uh, but there's shrubs and bulbs and perennials and annuals and seeds and vegetables and herbs that a lot of people grow, but they didn't buy. They got it from somebody who got it from somebody who got it from somebody. And there's reasons why some plants get passed around and others don't. Some of it is history. Anyway, I'm going to be doing that uh, at noon next Wednesday for the Mississippi Department of, of uh, Archives and History. It's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be a free thing. I'm going to be on a stage with a little screen in front of me, a big screen behind me, and i uh, actually going to take a few questions on it, too. So, And we'll give some more details on that. i also like to, to say that the petition to put a magnolia flower on our new state flag has gotten a huge traction, thank to y'all. If you want to know more about that, I'll give details on how you can read about it, learn about it, Maybe get excited about it, even support the petition that's going to go to the Department of Agriculture and History. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. All right, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rush. You can get some lines open if you want to give us a call and talk about gardening. Got a lot of stuff going on right now, even in my own garden. Uh, this past week, I uh, replanted some corn and some squash. And this is my first summer. Keep in mind that usually this time of year, I'm overseas. I, I, I live in England from, from covering the flower shows from May until early September or so, and they're all canceled. So I've had an opportunity this summer to plant some real vegetables, squash, 
beans, peas, corn, sweet potatoes, uh, peppers, okra, tomatoes. And I'm growing them as garden, not as like a vegetable garden, but as yard plants. I made some teepees out of some bamboo spray painted in purple and put a little glass insulator like a telephone pole at the top and planted climbing beans on that and corn around it and squash in front of it and in between sweet potatoes. But uh, I also have little groups of corn and squash and tomatoes and peppers mixed in here and there in my regular flowers in some containers and all. The reason I'm saying all this is because uh, some of it is, is, is at the end of its season. You know, they don't live all summer. This is a great time to replant stuff for fall. As a matter of fact, if you can find them, tomato plants and pepper plants put out this month in July in the Deep South. And my folks up, my friends up up north just can't believe this because they have to wait till Memorial Day to plant stuff and harvest before Labor Day. But you can plant stuff this month in July, first part of August, and get a beautiful, thick, full, incredible, productive harvest uh, in, in October, November. As a matter of fact, peppers and tomatoes set out right now, mulched to keep the roots cool, watered as they need. They will grow thick and sturdy, and they'll fruit up when it starts getting cooler in just a month and a half or so, like you would not believe. Fall harvests are often surpassed summer harvests. So it's just a matter of getting out and doing it and what I've been doing a little at a time, trying to get it done early in the morning. Um, one of the plants that I, and, and, and again, if you've got some questions about your garden, I know we have trouble with insects and diseases. I, I do too. The squash vine borers wiped out my, my squash, um, and I have had to replant with a net this time. Uh, so I get it. Be glad to, to, to yak with you. Uh, but I did something kind of fun this week. Last week, a lady called and said that her peaches weren't doing that well. They were, had a, 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 a fruit rot, which is real common. And I said, based on, I was raised in a fruit orchard. I, I work with fruit growers and I grow fruit myself. A lot of my friends are fruit growers, but it ain't easy. I said, this is the reason we don't have any big commercial f- peach orchards in the state anymore because the labor, the pruning, the sprays, the weekly, and at least once or every week or two spraying is hard to do, is expensive, is dangerous. I said, we don't have any. Well, I got an email from a lady as soon as I got off the air. She said, well, there's a real sweet little farm up in North Mississippi. I get my peaches from, and it's a farmer's market. And I said, whoa. I got online. It's called Murphy Orchards. Murphy's. They're from Calhoun County. And I drove up there, meandered through the state, through little small towns, Bruce and Vardaman and Winona. And, I mean, I just meandered. It took me five hours to get there, five hours to get back, and it's only a two-hour drive. But anyway, I visit with these folks, the uh, the Murphys. It's a retired couple. They've got a couple of three hundred trees. They pick, they grow their peaches. They grow their plums. They have their their the plum uh, peach, plum jelly, peach butter, homemade. Uh, 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 honey that's got bits of chewy honeycomb in it. I had a great time going up and visit them. I came back and made my first peach pie that I've ever made from scratch, a peach pie with ice cream, and it was terrific. Java, I don't know if you noticed, I got I brought you one big old peach because that's, that's all I had left. That's what I'm about to say. You didn't bring me into the pie. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I got one, one little crusty piece left, and I, it's just enough to, to sop up that ice cream I got. But also, I brought uh, some plums from their place for your kids. Okay. Now, these are bigger than what you're going to find at the store, and here's why. The Murphys are old-school home mom and pop growers and they go out when their trees get through blooming they go out and by hand they pick almost all the fruit off their trees you know if they make a cluster of flowers they're real pretty but when the flowers fall off there let's say there's five or six peaches or plums in a group they'll pop off all but two of them instead of getting a whole bunch of little runty hard things they get one or two great big luscious sweet juicy fruits because they go out and they knock off most of the fruit in the spring. Ain't nobody at home going to do that. So anyway, I really appreciate folks who have that much attention to detail, that much dedication. Uh, they're so dedicated that uh, I found out that when their their church was closed because of the virus, they held services. People brought their lawn chairs. They had services out in their peach orchard among the peach flowers. Ain't that cool? Well, thank you to the Murphys. You bet. Well, uh, there's there's three plums there they better make it to your kids hey i'm just saying i'm just saying but that peach it might melt before lunch anyway uh let's let's go uh to um oh and fondred uh johanna joe is it johanna joanna what joanna johanna Johanna. Johanna. hey what's up 
uh, nothing but much, not a big problem, but I wanted to ask you about my favorite purple wildflowers that bloom in the fall along the goldenrods. Yep. They've got these little squiddly heads. It's like the end of the plants look deformed or burnt or twisted or something. And I didn't know. I thought, should I pull them up or should I cut them off? Oh, boy, that's weird because, you know, I live in Fondren, too, and my yard looks like a wreck right The front corner by my driveway looks like a wreck because it's designed to be at its peak in the fall, and it's got a lot of great fall wildflowers that just look like a bunch of weeds right now. Um, but, I, you know, is it a showy flower? It makes that little purple soft flower, like when the goldenrods bloom, and it's, uh, I think it's called agarir, something like oh, that. Oh, az- azuratum. It's, but it's a, it's a wildflower, it's a native, but I think it's kin to that plant. It well, looks similar to it. Yeah, there, there's a wild azuratum, and it's kind of invasive. It spreads, right? I love it. I yeah. love it. It can spread. That is, it's, 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 I've got it on my, I've got it and goldenrod, and there's another one's called ironweed that's tall like goldenrod that has deep royal purple flowers. But no, this wild azuratum is a, is a terrific fall pollinator plant. It's great for, for pollinators. Um, and here's the problem. If you live in, in, in Fondren, we can get away with stuff because we have kind of a funky part of town. Mm-hmm. But if you want to make it look better, put you a, a gazing ball or a, or a piece of fence or an urn or a statue or a, a, a bottle tree, something like that in it to make it look like there's flowers around a little sculpture piece of art thing. That'll help the neighbors accept it a little bit better. Well, my problem with this, it looks like it's got some kind of disease on it or something. Yeah, it the gets The lower pa- leaves look okay, but the top leaves just look like they've been, like something, like they look misshapen or malformed or something, like and, they've got something wrong with them. And, and it could be because even even native plants get have a problem with aphids and spider mites, which deform the, the leaves and flowers and stuff. But what you could do, you could it, it just ignore it. You know, some of it will do fine. Or else you can go back and trim it back a little bit now. And if you trim it, same thing with the goldenrod. I cut my goldenrod back usually this month, uh, you know, at different heights instead of big, tall, that floppy. That is good to know. Yeah, you know, instead of big, tall, floppy stuff, if you cut it back, it bushes out. It's more compact and has more flowers. I've always wondered about that, and I thought, is there a time you can cut it back and yeah, make it bloom better this, or not? But this, I've never done it because I was chicken. This month, this month. Well, we cut some and leave some. We cut some low and some medium and leave some, yeah. some tall. Yeah, that make it look more interesting and make it have... That you're right. That would be much better. But if you put some kind of hard feature out there, a piece of split rail fence, anything that looks kind of rustic, this uh, uh, sort of a what they call a hard feature, then the wildflowers can come and go, and the neighbors won't think you just need to weed your flowers. Okay, let me ask you another question. I've got a Japanese maple that's planted under like bigger trees, an oak tree. An oak tree limb fell on it, is not, and just took one of the limbs and split it off, but it split it down into the trunk a yeah. good ways. Mm. Is it going to die a slow death? You think, or should yeah. I? Just- it, it it will, but at the same time, it could take 50 years to do it. Okay, okay, because I cut off the limb and took some duct tape and tried to patch it up. No, no, if if you do that within seconds, it can it can make a difference. What I would do is get get you a good sharp knife and go in and cut it off. And around the edge of the, you know how it's split in the trunk, around the edges yeah. of it, make a nice little smooth cut all, you know, up and down. And that'll uh-huh. heal over more quickly than a, okay. the sort of a ragged cut thing. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and 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 just it's just going to have character. That's all. All right, it can have character. I was just hoping it wouldn't die. The other thing I wanted to ask you: I love geraniums, I love them, but I kill them. Are there any tips to grow them? My daughter gave me one for Mother's Day. It was so pretty, and I'm just I'm yeah. just waiting for make it leggy and get where it's yellow and that, messed up. No, we're, we're talking about the ones that have the the leaves sort of smell like dirty socks, right? I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I kind of a spicy, it. spicy. Uh, but the traditional geraniums. Uh, yeah, pe- the big, pe- pretty red. I've got yeah, pe- pe- red pe- pe- pelargonum. Uh, anyway, here's the deal on those. They like cool weather better. They won't. You know, they'll take a little bit of a, fro- a frost, a little freeze, but they won't take hard freezes. But they hate our summer heat and humidity. They grow best in real hot, dry. Uh, think abandoned old uh, dry, uh, drive-in movie theater along the California coast. You know, no rain at all. Uh-huh. They don't like the heat and humidity and a lot of water. So what you can do is uh, they, they do better over the, the winter, the spring, and the fall. They sort of shut down in the summer, and we tend to overwater them, which causes them to rot. So you can you can let them dry out, stone completely dry, leaves turn brown and fall off. And you feel the stems, they can still be nice and firm, water them, they'll sprout back out. So what I would do is cut them back a little bit to stimulate some strong new growth and let them get almost dry between waterings. 
Okay. And right. uh, and I'd put them where they get maybe morning sun. They need sun to bloom well, but they just don't like hot, radiated, all night heat like on a patio. Okay. okay. So so try that. And uh, if you just keep them alive the next uh, about month or so, they'll perk back up and bloom like crazy in the fall. Great. I love them. I love them. And one thing else I want to tell you, I do know who Pogo is. <laughs> That's who Pogo is. Well, good. Appreciate that. Thank <laughs> you, lady. All right. You have a good one. Yeah, I named this uh, possum I've got. Uh, and by the way, Pogo is on his last bag of cat food, Java. I rescued this little 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 Joey. Little He's bit. not going anywhere. Well, I hope not. You know, I've, he lets me scratch it when he eats now, and I bring him a, a slugs. And when I walk around at night, I find cicadas, and sometimes I get some worms and put them in there. But I've been feeding Pogo, getting him fat enough to let go. But uh, he's on his last bag of cat food. But he's named after a 1950s, uh, 60s, 70s cartoon character that was sort of like the, the political satirist of the day, sort of like Doonesbury of my, my youth. But anyway, Pogo's going to be let loose as soon as his bag of food is gone, so he better start toughening up. Um, let's let's talk with uh, – well, I got some cheesy music coming up, but let's talk with Kay, who's been hanging on. She's on the road. Hey, Kay, good morning. How are you doing? What's up? I had a really quick question. I'm going to take this mask off real quick and step outside. I have like a mini, a mini obsession with peaches, and when I heard her come in about the – um, peach farm. I wanted to get a little bit more information about it. And, and is it not too late in the summer now for for peaches or to they're, go up there? They're starting to wind down, but but commercial growers they plant early, mid, and late season crops. Uh, par- okay. Partly as insurance in case a late freeze catches the flowers of the early ones, but also to ex- extend their harvest. And uh, so they, you know, the 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 early ones are long gone. The middle ones are about gone. The late season ones are still coming in pretty good. Now, this place, I can't tell you how to get to it, but I will say if you draw, a, make an X, draw a line between Oxford and Startville and, uh-huh. another, and another line between Tupelo and Grenada, it's right at the X. It's, no, okay. it's north of, of, uh, of Vardaman. And uh, if you'll just go online, it's called Murphy Orchard. And they got a nice little Facebook. And they're, they're good as gold, good as gold. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, appreciate it. Oh, I want to ask you this. You said you got peaches? Well, I, 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 we grew up with, with a lot of fruit trees. Mm-hmm. And I always had fresh um, fruit growing up. And I, I have a peach tree, um, which was one of those trees that you had to have, like a male slash female tree. Right, peaches usually husband, do. Yeah, my husband cut um, one of my trees down as a surprise to show me how much he had cleaned up the yard. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, he, and he's still and he's still in trouble, right? Well, so, the, yeah, the tree yeah. had had many trials and tribulations because we live in Madison, and <laughs> the squirrels would take away my fruit before they got got ripe. And he was just and trying he, to do, bless his heart, Kay. Come on. Yeah, so it's okay. I, I'm okay <laughs> with it, but I didn't have any pieces this year, and it's like you just said that. I was like, wait a minute, I gotta. I got a call filled so I can buy well, you, these peaches. <laughs> you you can also get peaches at farmers markets. You know, some we actually have a large peach orchard up in North Mississippi. Uh, it's a big commercial thing. You know, they put them in refrigerators and all like that. But uh, uh, farmers markets, you know, in in, in Jackson, uh, you know, they they've got fresh peaches from across the south. I'll try them out. I just have a, a kind of little thing about they've got to be sweet. They've got to be free stone. <laughs> well, that, that, that's the reason I like the, the locally grown stuff because they leave it, you know, some of these other places, they pick them, they bathe them in, uh, they wash them in fungicides so they'll store better without rot, and they put them in the refrigerator. And they don't sweeten once, once they're off the tree. But these, the ones I got the other day, I got them on Tuesday. They were picked Tuesday. Okay, and, they, and you got and them they, No, no, I, I got them up at this, this place up in Calhoun County. Oh, okay. but uh, anyway, okay. you know, you can pick them up, and you know, if they're a little bit, you know, squishy, and they smell like peaches, they're gonna be good. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, appreciate it, Kay. All righty, I'll go to Mark before we take a. What you want to do, Java? You know, we're we'll gonna talk to Mark. He's been hanging on, calling from the Delta Belzona. What's up, Mark? Hey, how you doing, Phil? Fine. What's 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 going on? I got a question for you about planting uh, greens. I tend to plant certain types of greens, like rutabagas or whatever, uh-huh. in mid-August. And every time, it seems as if I have to plant not just rutabagas, but turnips, mustards. Can't help it yourself. If, you can't well, help no. yourself. Yeah, I know. But the problem I'm having is I have to plant them over and over. It's like they are, I broadcast them out. They'll come up, and then they just 
go away. And then I have to plan again. And every time I do that until I finally get a crop that stays. You got yeah. any idea what's eating them or what's killing them or what's well, what, what going time, on? What time are you are you doing this? I do it in mid August. Yeah. Here, here's a, uh, early September. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's the time to start doing it. Uh, here's here, here's the deal: when you put those seeds out there, uh, you know, first of all, put them a little on the thin side. Don't don't sow them real thick because if they come up thick, sometimes they get disease of the humidity and they just crowd each other. But uh, they've got to be. You know, those little seeds are are just you know they're like big seeds. They've got everything they need to get started. But if they start to split open and it's dry for a day or two, they're gonna die. So you got to be prepared to no 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 the greens actually come up the seeds germinate yeah and they have enough water they come up and i see little you know uh, greens they just melt up. away they just melt away right oh uh, try this is just just based on you know what i've been doing myself for a long time try sowing the seeds a lot thinner so they have more elbow room because if they're thick the humidity is going to cause them to have trouble you know if they're all disappearing it's going to be more prob- probably weather type thing rather than an insect maybe a disease but sow them thin wet them down but don't keep them wet and that's you know, that's, that's all i know to say you know, okay. I, I just don't know. You know, you you might call the county extension office uh, there in, in Canton. Uh, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, you're from. No, you're from Humphreys Belzona. County. Yeah, but yeah. Ca- call the county extension office. I don't know if they still have a county agent there in, in Humphreys County or not. But but call them and when it first happens, make them come out. Make them come out and take a look. All right, sounds good. Thanks a lot, Phil. Okay, I wish I could help you some more. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay, I found an old blues song that involved. A guy picking peaches all day, and they didn't talk much about it, but he, but he talked about how he got over his blues of working hard and having the blues in town and all like that, about taking his troubles away, going out with a, with a can of worms and going fishing and letting the cork bob his troubles away. And I'm thinking, that works. That works, Java. Bobbing her troubles away. Bobbing the blues away. I'm Horticulture's Fellow Rushing. Me and Java Chapman and uh, Kevin Farrell and other folks here at MPB are, are glad to be here, glad to yak with you, glad to bring this service to you, this opportunity to share. We've got some uh, some details of this program and also the Magnolia Flower Flag coming up. But take a real quick break and a little bit of a cheesy music. Come out with your phone calls about your garden right after this. I'm going down to the river. Got a cane pole. In my hand I got my red worms In a Maxwell house Coffee can I'm gonna sit Under a shade tree On a river bank Where it's cool I'm gonna close my eyes And dream and let the cork Bob away my blues I'm going to close my eyes and dream and let the cork bob away my blues. Well, I said, boy, I work dirt all my life. The things ain't been good for a while. Why don't you move to the city, make a little money? You might be the first one in the family to ever die with a smile. Well, I took his advice Things are going well But my friends are far and few Whoever said a city boy Could have them country blues Whoever said a city boy Could have them country blues Whoever said a city boy Could have them country blues Well, honey, they ain't tall me you Hey, this is Malcolm White. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. 
Every week we talk with visual artists, musicians, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. All righty, folks, welcome back. Going to bob away my blues. Got a big old coffee can full of worms and going to, yeah. Whatever it takes, folks, uh, hunker down in the middle of the day. I do my walking in my garden in the morning, late in the afternoon, because in the middle of time, it is just not fun at all. Hey, we've got a couple of callers. We'll get to them in just a second. But let me mention this. Uh, the petition uh, right now, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, the Flag Commission, is accepting uh, uh, people's ideas for uh, drawings or whatever they want to, for a new flag from Mississippi. They're accepting them now up until first part of Sept- uh, August, I think. Anyway, if you'd like some information on the possibility of having a magnolia flower, our state flower, we are the magnolia state. we got the Avenue of Magnolias. It's on every historic marker in the state since 1949. If you'd like some information about that and to support it with a petition, which, by the way, is in its fifth level of support. In other words, this surpassed what we want. The more people, the better. Uh, go to um, this website. is Magnolia Flower Flag. Just Google magnoliaflowerflag.org. You can go to my website, my, my, my blog, fellowrushing.blog, but magnoliaflowerflag.org, and it's got a, just a one-page thing about the history of magnolias and a little about them and, and uh, the, the idea behind it, uh, and also a link to the petition. Uh, please do that. You know, the more support, the better. Now, we're just trying to have something that represents the magnolia state, sort of like the Lone Star of Texas or the Palmetto of South Carolina, rather than just some generic thing that we're going to, you know, we could end up with otherwise. You like the idea of a magnolia flower on the state flag of the magnolia state uh go check it out magnolia flower flag dot org uh, i'm not gonna try to sell you anything and also if you'd like to tune into this uh this uh, uh lecture i'm gonna be doing with slides about great old pass along plants and the history and the names and anecdotes and how to get them and what they mean and all that kind of stuff next wednesday uh, the, the, from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, it's going to be live streamed on the Mississippi Department of Archives and Histories uh, Facebook. Just go to Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Just Google it. Take it to their, their their page at the very top. Click on the Facebook thing, and it'll be it'll be archived there later. But that'll be a whole lot of fun. Hope to see some of y'all there. Uh, meanwhile, we've had folks hanging on for a long time. We're going to start out with uh, Sue in Beaumont. Hey, Sue. Good morning. Thank you for holding. Hi, Felder. I want to ask you a question. Can can you hear me? I'm having phone oh, trouble. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I, I had a couple friends out in the yard, and they were checking to see what was out there in the woods that abuts my uh, backyard, you know. And uh, they found some elderberry uh, elderberry bushes loaded with fruit and some uh-uh. bullet vines uh-uh. loaded with fruit. And they also found a, some little twiggy-looking bush that had fruit on it that I didn't know what it was. It's about as big as the end of a man's thumb. It's green and bulbous. It had a banana wheat. Tasted taste to it, and it had two black seeds in it. Somebody said it might be a pawpaw. You what, was it, what it was? Was it a tree? It, it was like a little bush. Well, pawpaws are trees. Mm, well, and, but but that, that's that's what they sound like. But I, I you know, I, without seeing it, I I don't know. I, and not all that, but I wouldn't eat it if I didn't know, didn't know what it was. Well, but, I, I, someone sent me a picture off off, off Wikipedia or something. And, the, the, the pictures that they, they sent what showed these pawpaws were like a, big enough fit in somebody's hand. Well, some of them are, you know, twice as big. I mean, there, there's a lot of different varieties and a whole lot of different seedlings out there. And they're all, I was raised with pawpaws, but they're trees. Oh, uh, well, this was growing on a little bush, so I, I didn't know what it's it was. A, send, me, send me a picture because you got my curiosity up. If it's that good, I want it in my yard. Delicious. Well, thank you. Okay, pre- be sure to send me a picture because I want to find out, Sue, okay? Okay, bye bye. Appreciate it. All righty. Don't know. She said it was good. <laughs> By the way, while we're off the air, some lady called and said that elderberry is good for hemorrhoids too, but I ain't going there. I I ain't going there. So let's go to let's talk to Willie down in Long Beach. Good morning, Willie. Howdy. Morning. How are you doing? So far so good. What's up? Got a pair two pear trees that are now blooming this year. Mm. Uh-huh. I cut them back. They bloomed the first year I put them out. Yeah. 
they they both produce uh, about three three uh, or maybe th- two on one and and one pair on the other. Uh-huh. A cut back about four feet. They uh-huh. grew back top, but they're not producing. I preferred to fertilize a little bit last year. Yeah, well, you but, know, they they need a little fertilizer, not a whole bunch, but a little scattered out away from the trunk because their roots are well out there. So don't you know throw fertilizer scattered out away from the trunk. Um, but did what time? When did you prune it back? What time of year? Ah, uh, second fall. Okay, Th- that they they go your flowers. Uh, the things that bloom in the oh. spring, like blueberries and pears and apples and things like that, they bloom in the spring on what grew the last half of the summer before. See, so okay. so if you prune them in the you know after let's say first part of you know end of July, first part of August, they don't have time to have new growth and make flower buds. So generally, you prune them by just thinning some out and leaving some unpruned. To always make sure you have some, or else uh, prune them just as soon as you get through picking them, so they have time oh. for for the new growth to come out. But, but uh, you know, if you prune them, you know, in the late summer, fall, or winter, ain't gonna have any fly. Leave a few stems unpruned, and then, and then you could cut those the next year. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. In other words, don't cut the whole, don't whack the whole thing back at one time. And there you go, you flowers. Ah, oh, that's what I did. I whacked the whole thing down. And also, oh, also keep in mind, Willie, there's not a whole lot of of uh, of of, pl- of uh, pears that 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 bloom well on the coast. Most of them need a colder winter than you have on the coast. There are a few that'll do down there, but a lot of the best oh. peaches they need a they need a long cold spell in the winter to set flower buds. It might just be that you know that that the, being on, the coast living is just wearing them out like it does people. Yeah, it's just hot. Yeah, you're so, right. anyway, good good luck on it, man. Okay, thank you, here. You bet. Appreciate it. Okay, now let's slide up to Canton. Uh, Billy, how are you this morning? Oh, Clinton, I'm sorry. Bifocals. What, what's up, Billy? Hello? Felder. Yes. I have uh, I have a two-acre lot. I've got uh, muscadine vines and seven or eight of my trees. I mean, they are mature muscadine vines, and they don't have any... Uh, muscadines on Mm -hmm. is there something i can do to try to get some started uh how many different how many different kinds of vines you have these are these are wild muscadines okay i I, I wouldn't know they were scattered by the birds i'm sure here here's the deal uh muscadines in the wild are either male or female the, yep. And you can't tell till they get mature enough to start flowering. And it could be that you got a bunch of males out there that have little male flowers, and that's all they're going to do. So unless you yeah. have both male and female, and the and the, the females get pollen from the males by bees, ain't going to have any. That's the reason commercial growers grow these what they call self-pollinating varieties. That uh, one will pollinate itself, because the wild ones are highly highly. Uh, uh, you know, you you never know what's going to get. Just like with kids, got a family with a whole bunch of big, big, big family, lots of kids, and some of them are okay. dumber than dirt. Same thing with okay. muscadines. Okay, I I took your advice your advice a long time ago, and I went down to Billy Hutto's, mm-hmm. and I bought the self pollinating muscadines from a, a farm up in northwest Mississippi. Yep, that, that's the way. And you do. and, and uh, I uh, I have not brought any here. Well, yeah, the the, the the wild ones, you know, you can't predict whether they're going to have any decent fruit or not. Some do and some don't. But even then, only the female is going to have berries. And then only if there's a male that pollinate them. And you can't tell which of which till they get mature. So, as yeah. I, you know, when it comes to, to home growing stuff, the lady who called earlier, she she was talking about this wild fruit she found out in the woods. And she yeah. said there were some elderberries. And she said there were some bullaces. Bullaces are wild dark. That's a, a, a name for a folk name for wild dark. Muscadines, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, and, and, you, you uh, need to get store. If you want production, go with store bought. Well, and and that's uh, uh, that's you know, bottom I, line. I, that's what I did on the farm. Yeah, that, that's, that's, just, that's, got, that's just that's just bottom line. Just bottom line. Okay. Well, I I would have felt like you know with eight trees with the the vines on at least one of them been a female would it, yeah it, it, luck of the draw though just same with persimmons wild persimmons are male and female the japanese will pollinate themselves but you know they're just it's luck of the draw if you want fruit go with store-bought yeah i i was i was telling uh a friend of mine uh in a group deal about the male and female on the persimmon mm-hmm. 
and she wouldn't believe me. And the guy, the guy that was in the room, he called his dad up at Mississippi State to confirm that there are male and female persimmon. The wild ones, yep, separate male and separate female. No, I mean you got to have them both nearby in the pollinating thing. This is just this is called science, and they, some people just don't believe science, and you can't tell I, I them. Do. Okay. Well, good luck on it, Billy. I appreciate your, appreciate your help. Stay All right. safe. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Now let's slide down to the Gulf Coast and talk with Brenda. Hey, Brenda, thank yes. you for calling. How are you? Hi, Felder. I'm fine. Thank you. Um, I spoke to you probably a couple of years ago about my dogwood tree. Mm-hmm. I had had it in the pot for about three years, and I was planting it in the ground. And uh, he told me to go get some dogwood dirt, which I never found. However, it was doing fine, doing great. And after this uh, crystal ball storm we had down here on the coast, uh-huh. I looked at it the next day or two, and it was brown. The leaves were brown. Uh, it was just dead. Yeah, well, it, it, it wouldn't be. Brown. <laughs> it, it could. Dogwoods are native across the, the eastern Half of the United States, yeah, from Florida up to to, to New Hampshire. Yeah, but I they, lived in Tennessee. For yeah, a long but, time. but but here's the deal. Hang on, Brent. They only grow naturally. Birds drop their seeds all over everywhere, but you never see them in nature except on a slope in the woods. Right. You know, you never see them along fence rows and birds drop the seeds out there because dogwoods like a specific type of habitat, which is, uh, and they'll grow in the full sun. They're growing flat dirt, but they they grow best in. Well drained, woodsy, slopey type of soils, yeah. and and uh, and if they stay way too wet or way too dry, or they're out in a lawn or just a whole lot of sun, they're stressed and they're more susceptible. One little thing pushing them over the edge. Yeah. Okay. Well. So I have a heavy heart. <laughs> but. Well, so, you know, sorry, you know, dogwoods are real, real popular, but you know, just like azaleas, there's other stuff out there that's a whole lot tougher. And what I do is I ride around and look, enjoy my neighbor's azaleas and my neighbor's dogwoods, and I grow more fun stuff in my yard that's less trouble. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Sorry, Brenda. Try again, that's though. Okay. Try again. I will. Okay. okay. Thank you, Felder. All righty, folks. Uh, it's been kind of wild. We had a lot of fruit calls. And I got an email this morning, uh, by the way, from from a lady who said that, that she has a whole bunch of hard uh, – she's from Florida, moved up to Mississippi, and so a neighbor gave her some little hard cooking pears, and she wasn't familiar with them. And there's two kinds of pears, just like there's sweet corn and there's field corn. There's – there's eating corn, uh, the eating pears, and there's cooking pears. And the cooking pears are hard and firm. A real popular one is called kefir. Starts with a K. It's self-pollinating, somewhat disease resistant, makes hard cooking pears. But here's the deal: if you want big, luscious, sweet fruit, you got to thin the fruit out. When they make a cluster of fruit. You can end up with a whole bunch of knobby little small hard things, whereas commercial growers like the Murphy's. By the way, if you go want to check them out, it's Murphy with a uh, P H R E E Murphy, uh, Murphy Orchard. If they go out by hand and thin out all but two or three peaches in each cluster. So that they end up getting so big you can't hardly pick them up. One at a time is all you can pick up those that have been thin versus five or six or seven little hard running knobby things. So fruit thinning is a is not an art. It's horticulture science. Pruning, thinning, spraying. It's not that easy. That's the reason farmers markets and local farms is the way to go. Uh, if you want to uh, check out this um thing I'm doing on Facebook. It's a live streaming thing. Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Next Wednesday, 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. If you go to, to Mississippi Department of Archives and History, click on their website. You know, Just Google it. And at the top, it has Facebook. And if you can't make it when it's live Wednesday, they'll have it on their Facebook page later to watch. And we're going to talk about things like this old uh, this plant I've got here. It's, it's called Montbrecia or Crocosmia. Long sprays of, of uh, orange flowers, tough as nails, easy to grow, hard to find commercially, but everybody's got some. I'd be glad to share with you. Also, check out the magnoliaflowerflag.org uh, petition. It's going great. That is our chance to put something fantastic on the Mississippi flag, the Magnolia, because we're the Magnolia State. Folks, there's a lot of things going on right now. It's hot, it's humid, 
It's dry, it's rainy, blah, blah, back and forth. It's not fun, but it's real satisfying. This weekend, I'm going to plant some more tomatoes and peppers in a big old pot. I'm going to uh, uh, start picking my okra real soon, my corn. I'm going to set out a few more flowers for fall. I'm going to try to take it easy. I'm going to walk around the neighborhood and enjoy my other na- my neighbor's flowers. And mainly, I'm just going to chill because that's all you can do, just chill. I'm a horticulturist fell to rushing. Java Chapman, my awesome producer, has got some peaches to take to his kids, uh, some plums to take to his kids that were grown in Mississippi. And uh, Kevin Farrell and all the other folks at MPB. Folks, let's take a chance this weekend to show kids how to do what's right. Take them to a farmer's market. The garden centers don't have a lot going on, but they got